Well, you know, we're very, very honored to have Dr. Chris Field give our closing keynote and it's on a hopeful solutions note around finding that accelerator pedal to speed up mitigation and, and adaptation. Uh, Dr. Field is a director of the Woods Institute for the Environment and a professor for interdisciplinary environmental studies at Stanford. His research focuses on climate change, especially solutions that improve lives now, decrease the amount of future warming and support vibrant economies. Prior to joining Stanford, he was the founding director of the Carnegie Institution's Department of Global Ecology. He led the effort on the 2012 IPCC Special Report managing the risks of extreme events and disasters to advance climate change adaptation, and on the 2014 impacts adaptation and vulnerability effort for the IP, IPCC Fifth Assessment Report. He's recognized by many awards for his work, including the Roger Revelle Medal and the Max Planck Research Award. He's a member of the AAAS and the National Academy of Sciences. So welcome, Dr. Looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. It's been a really fascinating session. I, I want to start by reiterating a comment that Ben Santer made about uh, what a privilege it is to uh, work in an environment that's so intensively focused on high quality work, finding solutions and and taking a proactive, positive approach to the future. And I, uh, I always feel privileged to be a, a member of the California science community and a member of the California political community. What I want to do today is make my slides work first. I want to share thoughts on uh, how we find that accelerator pedal. And I'm going to make brief comments on four topics. The first is, is what's the right target that we sh should be shooting for? Is it 1.5? Is it 2? Is it something else? Once we have a little better picture of what the target is, how much time do we have? And I especially want to dig into the idea of uh, differential responsibility, a key aspect of UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and something that I think is under discussed. And in particular, I want to talk about uh, who goes first, uh, by how much, especially how much California goes first by. And then fourth, you know, what are the things that we are or should be doing to find the accelerator pedal? I think in a setting like this, it's always used to go back to the, it's worthwhile to go back to the UN Framework Convention and uh, the question of what's the problem we're trying to solve. And if you look at the Framework Convention, it says the goal is stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Now, unfortunately, I, I would argue that we have just spent the last two days hearing about impacts of climate change that have already caused dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So there's some sense in which we can have not and cannot uh, meet the objectives of the UN Framework Convention. There's some aspect of that that makes it less than relevant, but there are other aspects that are empowering in the sense that they release us to look more broadly for solutions that work for ecosystems for people, for economies. And a, and a good way to start with that is to look at the wording of the Paris Agreement, where specifically the framers argued that the goal of that agreement is holding the increase in global average temperatures to well below 2C above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5C above pre-industrial levels. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty about it what it, what that means. Does well below 2C mean 1.5? Does it mean something between 1.5 and 2? Does it, does it mean about 2? And those sound like they're all pretty similar things, but given where we are in the arc of already warming the planet to levels that are very close to 1.5, it turns out there's a huge difference in what we need to do 
depending on whether that targets 1.5, more like 1.8, or about 2. And that's the main topic that I want to share thoughts with you on. If you look across all of the work that's been done on climate change impacts to date, I think the simple way to summarize and not only comments at, at this workshop, but in all the IPCC reports is that increasing magnitudes of warming lead to increases in the likelihood of impacts that are severe, that are pervasive, and that are irreversible. And, and that implies a kind of a gradualism in the impacts with the amount of warming. And the real question that we would like to address is whether or not that's right or whether there are important thresholds or tipping points in the climate system. And people of here have already talked about some of those in California, but what are the kinds of tipping points that might be consequential at the, at the global scale? The way we've addressed that in the IPCC is to focus on something that we've called large scale singular events. And you can see from this figures from the 2014 report, but the same uh, threshold is in the 2018 1.5 versus two degree report, indicating that there is a moderate risk of these large scale singular events starting around the temperature we're at now, something like 1C over pre-industrial. And the risk goes from moderate to high at temperatures around 2C above pre-industrial. And in past iterations of thinking about what the target for limiting warming should be, this discussion and consideration of the transition from moderate to high risk of large scale singular events, tipping points in the climate system is a reasonable place to start. There's been a lot of work on tipping elements in the last several years, especially with strong leadership from Tim Lenton and Will Steffen and uh, John Schellenhuber. And a lot of the recent work has emphasized the way that these tipping elements aren't just individual things, but they can interact in ways that cause tipping point cascades such that one element tipping increases the probability of others. And an important feature of where we are with our current understanding of tipping elements, and these are things that produce big changes in the Earth system or things that are potentially irreversible or things that start a vicious cycle of further warming, is that several are projected to tip at warming levels between uh, one and three centigrade. And that includes several related to ice, as well as tipping points related to coral reefs. My thinking about the, how we should approach the question of the target is that the kinds of tipping points that are most important is those that put us into a fundamentally different earth system regime uh, from which we won't be able to back out for many centuries, millennia, if ever. And the the um, best example of that is, is risk of sea level rise, large amounts of sea level rise from melting ice. And there are important issues associated with both Greenland from um, elevation climate feedbacks and Antarctica with marine ice sheet instability that have the potential to lead over many centuries to many meters of sea level rise. And as everybody knows, the estimates for sea level rise during the 21st century or uh, anywhere from a few tens of centimeters to as much as about a couple of meters. A couple of meters fundamentally reshapes the world's coasts and is certainly existential for um, millions of people who would have to move and for many wonderful cities. But at least for me, the, the real worry about a tipping point from melting ice comes in the risk of many meters of sea level rise from marine ice sheet instability, or as a result of underlying geography, uh, we become committed at a certain point to a very large amount of sea level rise. And what do we know about the temperature at which that, that might occur? This 2015 paper from Nature uh, is more or less a, a summary of the state of current understanding with RCP 2.6 representing something like a 2C world and 
RCP 4.5, something like a 3C world. And note that this is a very, very long simulation, goes from a uh, current period to 5,000 uh, in the current era. And what you see is that we're committed as a consequence of foreseeing in the near term to the potential for large amounts of sea level rise, especially with large amounts of forcing that um, could amount to, to many meters on the, the scale here is up to 10 meters of sea level rise, a level that is truly existential for dozens of small island nations, hundreds of wonderful cities around the world and, and a huge number of, of critical habitats. But it's also important to recognize that at the uh, approximately 2C, RCP 2.6 level of warming, we don't encounter the large marine ice sheet instability. And over the several thousand years of this particular set of simulations, you see uh, consequential levels of sea level rise, a, a large fraction of a meter, but not the kind that's totally transformative. So what I would argue is that the current understanding is that there's some risk of a marine sh ice sheet instability at sea level rise on the order of um, uh, temperature warming on the order of 1.5, that mostly we seem okay to about two. Other uh, tipping element that's really important related to thawing permafrost and the idea that carbon release from thawing permafrost could cause further warming that would create a vicious cycle warming and essentially be in a position to take over warming even if human emissions drop to zero. A summary of current understanding of the risk is that across a, a large number of modeling studies, we could see the release of several hundred billion tons of CO2 over the 21st century. These are uh, simulations with RCP 8.5, a, a high emission scenario, but something like uh, 340 on average billion tons of CO2 are released during the 21st century, a little less than a decade of current emissions, a lot, but not an overwhelming amount. Most of the indications are that if we can stabilize temperatures at approximately 1.5, we'll see somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to maybe 100 billion tons of CO2 released during the 21st century. Again, consequential, terrifyingly large amounts, but not at the level that really clearly pushes us over a tipping point at 1.5. And I think that across all the tipping points I'm going to discuss, we have strong evidence that there's a tipping point there, but not very high confidence about where it is. And I would say for both the sea ice and the permafrost thaw tipping points, it looks like the great risk of a tipping point is at temperatures over 2C. I'm gonna talk briefly about two tipping points that aren't usually included in the tipping point cascades of Linton and Stefan and others. And they concern a tipping point on whether society has the cohesiveness in order to effectively deal with a changing climate. This study from Marshall Burke and colleagues that was published in Nature a few years ago, and what they argued is that econometric analysis indicates very clearly that with additional warming, we expect increases in per capita GDP in countries that are already cool and decreases, large decreases in countries that are already hot with um, this simulation, again, for RCP 8.5, indicating that by the end of the 21st century, we could see decreases in per capita GDP as a result of warming that are on the order of 75 to 100% in Southeast Asia, 75 to 100% in Sub-Saharan Africa. At the same time, we're seeing increases in per capita GDP of as much as 50% related to climate in, in Europe. And, and I would argue that this is the kind of climate pressure that makes it really hard to imagine a society that has the cohesiveness internationally in order to be able to tackle the core problems. And then a, a final aspect of tipping points that I think is really important is the question of uh, whether we have the, the potential to adapt. And when I look at this map of 
projected global temperatures for RCP 8.5 at the end of the 21st century is totally terrifying. And, you know, I've written many papers about expectations for climate impacts in this world, but it is so different than the world of today. Really, really difficult to have any confidence in projections. But if I look at this world from RCP 2.6 and approximately 2C world, and I compare that with the um, with the amount of warming that we've seen in the last century, what I see is a, a challenging environment, but with future warming at more or less the same scale we've seen in the last century, and good prospects for dealing with that with committed investments in, in adaptation. So where does that leave us with, with what's the right target? It's clear that dangerous anthropogenic interference is already here and that's not gonna be the right standard for us to use. It's also clear that risks increase rapidly with further warming. And it's clear that there are risks of tipping points and tipping point cascades. It's clear that uh, those risks rise and the evidence indicates that they rise rapidly above 2C. And then uh, finally, I think we need more work on this, but, but I think the evidence is indicating strongly that a critical tipping point for setting the target is that the potential for adaptation really fades rapidly once we, we have warming that's substantially above 2C. Let me shift a little bit to uh, ethical framing and one of the issues that's so important about climate change, again, speaks to the comments that my colleague Ben Santer just made about the importance of uh, recognizing the ethical components of this challenge. And it's important to recognize that as we look at solutions for the climate crisis, we also have to be looking at solutions to rational aspirations for economic development. And we, we can't address climate by shutting down the global economy. And we can't address climate by foreclosing on legitimate aspirations of the majority of the world's people, uh, trapping them in poverty. And so when we look at the point we want to set for addressing climate change, we need to recognize that large amounts of warming increase the risk of climate damage. Too aggressive action increases the transition risk from foreclosing on legitimate opportunities. A, a way to think about it in human terms is a too slow transition subjects billions of people to unnecessary climate damages. A too rapid transition traps billions in poverty. So how do we find the right level? One thing that's been incredibly helpful in figuring out how to do this is to recognize that Warming is associated with cumulative emissions, essentially since humans started emitting greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Our emissions through 2019 have been a little bit more than 2,300 billion tons of CO2. We have good evidence from climate models that the warming uh, of 1.5 C or having a 66% probability of limiting warming to 1.5 C or less requires having a cumulative carbon emissions of around 2,800 billion tons of CO2. For a 2C target, that number increases to about 3,500 billion tons of CO2. And um, you can uh, do the, the arithmetic, the total amount that's remaining for limiting warming with a 66% probability to less than 1.5 is a little less than 500 billion tons. The amount remaining for a 66% probability of less than two is about 1,200 billion tons. It, it's pretty clear that the biosphere is not going to be our friend in coming decades, and we should probably subtract about 100 billion tons from each of those numbers in order to get a realistic estimate of how much the atmosphere will actually see. And 2019 emissions were on the order of 43 billion tons. And so you can calculate on how, how long we would have at a, at a constant rate. There've been lots of analyses of whether or not it's feasible to limit warming to 1.5 C or less. My Stanford colleague, Mark Jacobson, has been a strong advocate of the idea that it is feasible to have a 100% renewable energy system by 
2050. And Jacob's calculations and his formulation are, are really brilliant, but they really de depend on, on everything going right. Uh, you need to have a world with no political, social, or economic friction. And I'd argue that that's not the, the world we've got. So when we think about allocating the remaining budget, how do we do that? You know, for me, the Paris Agreement is a really inspirational document, and it's really useful to think about what it uh, what it accomplished. And I would argue that the the most important thing about the Paris Agreement wasn't anything about the uh, quantitative, nationally determined uh, commitments that that nations brought forward, it was, it was two fundamental things. The, the first is an agreement among all the world's nations. I, I hope it's back to all the world's nations after January 20th about what a fair allocation of responsibility looks like and the idea that a bottom-up determination of allocation is a fair way to look at the problem. And uh, painting a pathway for a predictable future that allows countries and communities and individuals to position themselves in a, in a, in a globally uh, understandable framework. So what are, what are the implications of that for budgeting? There are lots of ways you could think about an ethical, rational, efficient way of doing carbon allocations moving forward. Um, here's the, the numbers for three of them. And, and if you say, um, we're just going to, uh, everybody gets an, an amount that's uh, proportional to their um, to their historical emissions. That, that ends up with, with a lot for North America. If you make a calculation that says, well, if you already used up more than your fair share, then North America and Europe are already deeply in the hole. And uh, there's no single way that's a rational, ethical way to do a budget. But I want to uh, propose a, a pathway that I think can work for everyone consistent with the Paris Agreement framing of, of what's a fair approach. And if we start with the idea that a budget for 2C is going to be something like um, 1,100 billion tons of CO2, and we're going to be looking at a world in the latter half of the 21st century that has about 9 billion people, I would argue that the 5 billion poorest are going to need to have carbon emissions that continue for at least the next 50 years, probably at an average of something like three tons per person per year, meaning a total budget allocation of 750 billion tons. The middle 3 billion, this is basically China and India, be expected to have um, carbon emissions for legitimate development aspirations for about the next 30 years, and an average of maybe six tons per year to get to a total of about 270. So that, that leaves the remainder for the richest billion. And um, it's about 100 billion tons of CO2. Um, if we use that up at, the, at the, well, the, the current rate for Germany is about nine tons per year. For California, it's about 10 uh, per person. That, that means that um, we end up with, uh, with a time available that's pretty close to the 1.5 C time even though the, the world is now stabilizing at two rather than at, at 1.5. Of course, there are lots of ways you could think about the timing associated with these budgets and you could uh, use it all up really fast and then have a, a quick and probably catastrophic close of your carbon era. Uh, you, could, you could wind down more gradually. There's been a, a huge amount of discussion and I think a huge amount of confusion in this argument has come from the idea that, well, we can do negative emissions and negative emissions are essentially a get out of jail free card that lets us uh, think about uh, high emissions now and, and negative emissions in the future. But I'd argue that everything we know about negative emissions says we're going to need all we've got to be able to offset difficult to mish to difficult to manage emissions late in the century related to food and manufacturing emergencies things like california wildfires and that we're unlikely to have additional capacity so with this kind of framing that we really need to work under a strict budget a budget that looks like 1.5 even though it's more oriented toward a, a about two level what's the future look like and um I think what it looks like is that stabilizing at 
5C is probably technically feasible, but that it too strongly forecloses on legitimate development aspirations around the world. Stabilizing below 2C is, is feasible, technically, economically, and socially. The best part is that stabilizing below 2C provides prospects for a vibrant future. So uh, we, how do we go first? What are the limitations? Uh, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? One thing I find incredibly frustrating in this space is that every actor I know, including my university, argues that, well, if I can decarbonize on the global average, that's going to be good enough. But uh, average is, is not good enough. And there's a responsibility that each of us have, especially in a developed place like California, to be uh, carbon neutral well before the date when the last ton is, is emitted by the, the last actor. So uh, how do we do that? And why do we have to do it? Uh, it's so critical because leaders are critical for driving down the costs. They're critical for showing uh, that these uh, non-emitting energy systems, non-emitting energy pathways can operate reliably. And they also are critical for leading a virtuous cycle of um, of rising ambition. And when I look at the factors that have been important in allowing the world to begin to make progress on climate change, those, those three things are, are really critically important. Driving down the costs so that the renewable energy options are the economically compelling one for actors around the world. Of validating reliability and doing the R&D in order to bring in the technologies that really can make a difference and leading a virtuous cycle of rising ambition. And I think that it's critically important to recognize that the world has not yet embraced anything like the level of climate activism that's going to be required for uh, stabilizing warming at, at less than 2C and that the only way that we can bring together the global community around uh, the feasibility and the compelling imperative for reaching that level is to uh, is to take the lead. And I'm incredibly proud to be a citizen of California, where I think we have the potential to really be demonstrative and be effective at all three of these key agendas, driving down the costs, validating the reliability, and leading a virtuous cycle of rising ambition. So thanks so much for the work that all of you do, and thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts. Thank you so much for that thought-provoking talk. Um, we have just a little bit of time. I'm wondering if uh, we have a little time for question. Would someone like to ask a question? You know, while people are looking for questions, I'm wondering if you could comment on any analyses around political instability. I'm sorry? Political instability associated with what we, what we might be seeing as we approach to. Well, you know, there've been a, a large number of studies that have asked whether or not climate change has been linked to violence that's already occurred. It's been a very contentious topic with some studies um, having high confidence identification of links and other studies arguing that it's, that it's um, really Im impossible to tell yet. I, I was associated with a really nice expert elicitation that was published in Nature last year that indicated that this is an area where the experts really agree that climate change is highly likely to be an important factor in increasing conflict in the future. And that the arguments that make it appear so contentious are mainly about technical details and not disagreements about the fundamental nature of the way it drives changes and the, and the fundamental way that the risk scale with increasing warming in the future. Um, thank you. I have a question 
from Dave Shuka, Shukla are what are some of the models for vibrant development in the future in the 1.5 target? Well, uh, part of the reason that I personally tend to um, step away from the 1.5 target is the one that that um, is achievable is that the emissions reductions that are required are, are so rapid that I don't see them uh, providing the opportunities for the low carbon development pathways that poor countries around the world have a have an ethical and economic right to aspire to. The, the, the basic challenge with rapid decarbonization is that if you got a society with a mature power environment, you can, you can make a heavy commitment to intermittent renewables. If you don't have an established power grid and established energy system, then uh, you really suffer with deployment of renewables. And a key missing element that we fundamentally need more work on is, is long-term storage. And at this point, it really doesn't make sense to tell um, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo or Malawi that they should commit to a 100% renewable energy system when there is not a compelling long-term storage option available. I think we're within a few decades of that, but if, if I were the energy minister in Malawi, I would be looking at one more generation of uh, traditional fossil power plants, either in natural gas or coal. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your talk. And um, we're going to now move to the uh, final closing remarks for the meeting. But that was uh, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.